Thank you again for joining us as we continue in our series, Fear. Welcome everybody to Element Church. So glad you're joining us. I'm gonna give a shout out to St. Charles, everybody watching online from coast to coast and around the world. We are in week two of our series, Fear. We're learning how to conquer fear and we're learning how to live courageously, how to live boldly. Speaking of boldly, there was a man who died and he was at the pearly gates and St. Peter was there, King David was there, some of the great heroes of the Old Testament. And they said to this man, they said, we're responsible to help give out assignments for roles and responsibilities in heaven. And one of the things we look at was how courageous somebody lived their life for God. And as we're looking at your life, we're really not that impressed with a lot of courageous acts. Is there anything that maybe you could tell us to help us in our decision-making as to something courageous you did? The man thought for a minute, he goes, well, you know what? There was that one time I was driving down the road and I saw an elderly lady being harassed by a gang of thugs. And I said to myself, I'm gonna do something about that. I pulled over my car, went to the trunk of my car and I pulled out a baseball bat and I walked up to that gang of thugs harassing that old lady and I went to the leader of the group, big, tall, tattoos everywhere, big lip ring. And I grabbed that lip ring and I pulled his face to mine and I said, you better leave her alone are you gonna deal with me? Well, King David was like, wow, that's impressive. And they're like, when did this happen? He said about three minutes ago. <laughs> that's funny. We are in the book of Joshua today, chapter one, and God gives Joshua some very practical steps to overcoming fear and to living courageous. I wanna read Joshua chapter one, verse two. And then we'll read verse six and seven. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, be strong and courageous. Now, four times, God tells Joshua in one chapter, be strong, courageous, be strong, courageous. Why would God say that four times? Because Joshua needed to hear the words, be strong, courageous and courageous. Why? Because he was dealing with some fear. Now, he was dealing probably with two types of fear that we all deal with. There's fear on the inside, and then there's fear due to the things on the outside. He was probably battling some security issues, because think about this. Moses, his predecessor, was the greatest leader probably in human history. God met with Moses face to face. Moses confronted the most powerful nation in the world and Pharaoh and said, let my people go. 10 plagues were inflicted upon Egypt. The Egyptian army was drowned in the Red Sea. This is a stud. And how would you like to be the successor after that guy? Wrote the first five books of the Bible, the Torah. Like, that is some big shoes to fill. So I have a feeling that Joshua was feeling a little bit intimidated trying to fill the giant shoes of Moses. Secondly, he was probably dealing with some of the fears of trying to do what Moses was unsuccessful at doing, and that is taking three, th three million whining, complaining Israelites across the Jordan to face some fortified cities in a land full of giants. So he probably had some inside fear and he probably had some outside fear. And God tells him, be strong and courageous. And there's three practical steps that we're gonna get from this chapter that'll help you conquer any fear, whether it's inside or whether it's outside. And we're gonna get that from Joshua today. Now, before we do that, I wanna just take a moment as your pastor uh, to give kind of a house pastoring, pastoral moment regarding current events that we're facing today, the things that we see unfolding inside of the Middle East. Now, we have, this year alone, we've had 1,300 decisions for Jesus Christ at Element Church, between St. Charles, online, at all our physical locations, 1,300 decisions. Last year, about 1,700 decisions for Christ. So that means floating through Element Church, there's about 3,000 new believers, people that are new to Jesus Christ. And I know many of you, you've been a Christian, you got off Noah's Ark, a couple of you. Like, I, I get it. <laughs> now, 
we often have been around Christianity for a long time, take things for granted that we intuitively know because we've been in church so long. And we think everybody should know what we know. And we, we assume too much. And so I'm gonna backtrack to establish some important thoughts first about what I'm gonna address. Now, before you gave your life to Christ, chances are there were a lot of things that you did that you believed that weren't biblical. Now, you had a view of yourself before you came to Christ. What shaped your view? Probably wasn't the Bible. It was probably some friends. It was probably the news media outlets. It was probably some fashion magazine that told you what you needed to look like. You had a view of money. You had a view of sex. That high probability wasn't a biblical view. You had a view of the world. You had a view of politics. Now, God for so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son for every single individual. And while you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you and Christ died for me. And Jesus came to you and met you right where you were. The mess that you were with all your unbelief, misbelief, horrible lifestyle, Jesus met you there and he saved you right there. Amen. Amen. Yes. Now, contrary to some people's understanding, Jesus doesn't meet you there to leave you there. <laughs> Jesus met you there to change your life. The goal of Christianity is conformity, not to the world. You've been there, you've done that. It's now conformity to the image of Jesus Christ. The goal of a Christ for, follower is day by day, each one of us should look more and more like Jesus. Now, before you got saved, chances are <laughs> there were things that you were for that God was against. And there were things you were against that God was for. Now, as a Christian, our job is to get into the word of God every single day, coming to church every single day to look at the word of God, to let it change us. We don't come to change the word we let the word change us right. to conform us to the image of Jesus. So prior to you coming to Christ, you had a worldview. My question is this, what shaped that view? Well, your parents, probably. Your school education, probably. Your atheistic, woke promoting college professor, probably. An anti-Christian Media? Come on. Probably. So, your loyalty is to Jesus Christ as King of Kings. Amen. I'm an American. No, you're not. First, you're a Christian. The Bible tells us our citizenship is of heaven. Right. So, everything in our life, the default setting is this. What does Jesus say? The default setting is what does the Bible and what does the word of God say? You are a Christian before you're anything else and you're gonna spend a whole lot more time as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven than you will as a citizen of America or any other country. Amen. Okay, <clears throat> just thoughts. Now, I wanna talk about a couple important things. First of all, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. As a Christian, it is important that you and I understand and believe that Jesus loves everyone. For God is not willing that any should perish but all, everybody say all, all, all to come to the knowledge of the truth. As Christians, we have a responsibility to pray for everyone for them to have the opportunity and the eyes to see and the heart to receive the truth of God's love in Jesus Christ that they might be saved. That's our job. Now, that's not our only job. God sees the world in three people groups. And as you're reading your Bible, if you don't understand and stop to go, what people group is God looking at and how is the world being filtered through the word of God, you're gonna get confused when you read your Bible. 
there are three people groups living today that God sees. Jews, Gentiles, which is not a Jew, and the church. Now, the church was birthed with the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and the church age will last until the rapture of the church. The church is made up of two people groups, and that is Jews that believe in Jesus Christ as the Messiah, and Gentiles that believe Jesus Christ in the Messiah. That's the church. And when God is addressing throughout the word of God, he's looking at this present time, he looks at three specific groups, Jews, Gentiles, and the church. So how does God look at the world. He loves Jews, he loves Gentiles, and he loves the church. Now, <clears throat> this may come as a newsflash. Jesus was a Jew. <laughs> Whoa, I didn't know that. <laughs> this Bible has 66 books. 64 of which were written by Jews. If you are a Christian, you need to understand your Jewish heritage, even if you're a Gentile, because God revealed himself to Abraham, who's the father of the Jews, Abraham, I had Isaac, Isaac had Jacob, the 12 tribes of Israel come from Jacob. We are grafted into what is known as the vine, the branch of a Jewish religion. Therefore, you hear the term Judeo-Christian faith because it's rooted in Judaism. So what we have to understand is God's covenant and God's commitment to a group of people called the Jews and Israel. Now, it's not an accident that we happen to be in a series on fear this month. And what I love about how the Holy Spirit works is we have had for the entire year, October, to teach on fear. And what do we have? A bunch of current events that would cause you to probably go, I could probably use a message on fear. And it's also not an accident that I had planned on week two to be teaching out of Joshua chapter one. That also was not an accident. And so I was opening up and I'm studying. I'm like, I know I was gonna be in Joshua chapter one. And what do we come to? Some important things that we as New Testament believers must remember and must understand. Joshua chapter one, verse three. Every place the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea toward going up down to the sun shall be your territory. Now, God made a covenant with Abraham in Genesis chapter 15 that he said, this is an eternal covenant between me and your descendants. God reiterates that to Joshua, the exact same territory. Because what are many people complaining about today? Israel should give up territory to appease a people group that are demanding it. But I wanna go back to the Bible and what you and I must understand God says. Not the UN, God says. Not your news media outlet, God says. You are a Christian before you're anything else. God loves Palestinians. God loves Iranians, God loves Jews, and God loves you. It's not a matter of love. God loves everybody, but he also made a covenant to the Jews. Now, I wanna throw up on a map what that territory looks like that God promised Abraham, and that is way bigger than the nation of Israel. Israel will dwell in that covenant promise when Jesus comes and returns and rules and reigns during the millennial reign. So here we have, Israel has their land. Now, there is an anti-Semitic spirit that has been in the history of the world and you need to understand where it comes from. It comes from Satan. And let me tell you why it comes from hell. Because Satan hates the Jews. And I'll tell you several reasons Satan hates the Jews. Because God's Messiah was given to the world through the Jews. God told Abraham, all the world will be blessed through you and hell fears the Jews. Secondly, Satan is at a war to wipe out the Jews and I'll tell you why. Because if he can destroy the Jews or if he can keep the Jews 
from their homeland, he can shake his fist at God and say, God, you couldn't keep your covenant with Abraham. You don't have a right to be God. You don't have a right to that throne. Give it to me. Understand that you and I live in a natural world, but is full of spiritual battles. And the battle that takes place against Jews, Adolf Hitler was motivated by an anti-Semitic demon from hell to annihilate the Jews. So when the World War II is finished and the world goes in and sees the six million slaughtered, murdered Jews, the world for one time in human history says, wow, This is horrible. We need to give the Jews their homeland back. And in 1948, Ezekiel and the promise that God gave Israel was fulfilled. And I wanna read that to you, Ezekiel 36, 24. For I will take from you among the nations and gather you out of all countries and bring you into your own land. In 1948, that was fulfilled. Jesus said in Matthew 24, he goes, look, you wanna know the signs of the time? Watch this, watch Israel and watch Israel for the rebirthing and the budding of the nation of Israel. Israel is the timepiece that we as the New Testament church are to watch to see where God is at in time, end time, current events. So who said Israel is to be restored to their homeland? God. So anybody who goes, Israel should give up their homeland, which they were there before anybody else that's fighting over it today. You're going against the word of God. I wanna be on the right side of that. So to say I'm for Israel and we are for Israel as a church does not mean we're against a Palestinian. It doesn't mean we're against an Iranian because we pray for their salvation that they might know Jesus and be saved. The same time we're for Israel. Because God is for Israel. You have to understand that God is working inside of Israel. When the church is raptured, and I did a series on the return of Christ in August. If you missed it, go back and watch it. And I talked about what I see and many theologians see is the rapture of the church in Revelation chapter four and five. At Revelation chapter six, you don't see the church mentioned again. What you do see is Israel. And what you see from Revelation chapter six to Revelation chapter 19 is God working mightily in the nation of Israel to bring them to Jesus Christ. Now, there's a prophecy inside of Revelation where John sees 144,000 Jews that are saved, that believe in Jesus, Yeshua, and they go out throughout the world as Jewish evangelists preaching Jesus Christ to the world. One other reason Satan wants to wipe out Jews is because he knows there's gonna be 144,000 Jewish evangelists preaching Jesus Christ to the world. Satan knows this Bible better than you probably know this Bible. We are in a spiritual battle and we see that what's going on right now is part of biblical end times prophecy. Now, I don't have time to get into all this. I'm not an expert in end times prophecy, but if you wanna know more about Israel and where you should be standing as a Christian and you wanna know a little bit more about end times events as it relates to prophecy, I got a book I wanna recommend to you. uh, And I'm gonna give this book to everybody that wants it when they go to Amazon and buy it at Psalm 83. (laughs) So this book is entitled Psalm 83, The Missing Prophecy. And I don't necessarily go, yeah, everything in there I, I, I think is accurate when it comes to prophecy. You know, I kind of take it with a grain of salt and go, mm, that sounds interesting uh, because prophecy is best interpreted in the rear view mirror. And so, but there are some very interesting things in there. And there's some important prophecies, Isaiah 17 regarding Damascus being wiped out. There's things that have not yet been fulfilled that will be fulfilled. And I think we're living in some very critical end time prophetic seasons. I highly recommend that book if you wanna know more. Now, one other thought. Is this okay? (laughs) We live in a world where there's a vacuum of leadership that'll speak what people are needing to hear. And I won't allow that here at Element Church, and it's my job to tell you what you need to hear. (laughs) So... Thank you. 
I have two grand, had two grandfathers, uh, Jack Courtney. He was a Marine, and he was stationed on Ford Island on Hawaii, December 7th, 1941. My dad's dad, Kenneth Lawson, was stationed on a ship. He was swabbing the deck as a sailor, December 7th, 1941, Sunday morning. The planes came in and started bombing. Now, it was one of the, it's the worst terrorist attack on the United States at that time. <laughs> the world was at war with the axis of evil in Europe. And America did everything it could to stay out of the war. Because we had just come out of World War I. And we didn't want another war. But here's what happened. December 7th, America woke up to realize the war came to us. And we had to stand up and do something about it. 9-11, evil came to us. And we had to do something about it. Saturday, October 7th, evil came to Israel. And just as America had to go to war for peace, 9-11, America had to go to war for peace. Israel is doing what it has to do because it came to her. Israel didn't ask for this. It came to it. And just as we as Americans know we would defend ourselves and have, Israel has to defend itself because it must exist as a nation. <clears throat> and don't let any liberal, anti-Christian, unbiblical reporter tell and influence your view of the world any different than the word of God. Amen. To be for God is to be what God is for and God is for Israel. God is for the salvation of everyone and both of those can exist side by side as believers and we're commanded in Psalm 122 verse six, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, but history has proven that at times without war, you cannot have peace. Amen. Okay, just wanted to have that pastoral moment with you. Now, if you have a different view, if what I said offends you, I wanna ask a question, why? And I wanna ask this other question. Go to your Bible and prove me wrong. Come on. And you go to your Bible and prove me wrong and you can send me an email and I, we'll talk, we'll meet. But don't quote your college professor and don't quote some news media, you give me Bible and show me that what I'm saying is wrong inside of the Bible. All right, anybody ready for some practical steps on conquering fear? <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's good stuff. <laughs> Joshua chapter one, <laughs> one other verse, Genesis 1, 12, three. I will bless those that bless you. I will curse those that curse you. And then you, all the families of the earth will bless, be blessed. God told that to Abraham. And I genuinely believe one of the reasons this country is one of the most blessed countries in all the world is because we have been the greatest supporter of the nation of Israel. And we must never wane from the support for the nation of Israel because God has blessed us because we are a blessing to Israel. Joshua chapter one, verse eight, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in, for then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Step one, stay in the word. Step number one, stay in the word. You gotta stay in the word of God because the word of God has a promise for every problem that you face. You're gonna face a lot of problems inside. You're gonna face a lot of problems outside, but there is not a problem that you will ever face that God doesn't have a promise that is greater than the problem you're facing. Now you might be going, well, I can't find that promise. Like I had a crisis. I, I, I don't know where it is in the Bible. So I'm gonna give you the do default promise that God gave Joshua. And if you can't think of any other promise for whatever you face, this is the default that you go to and you're gonna be fine because it's the one he gave Joshua. Joshua 1.9, for have I not commanded you be strong and of good courage for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. If you can't think of one other reason to go, Nothing is bigger than my God that's standing with me, that's for me, that's in front of me, that's behind me, that's all around me. That's the only promise you need is to understand that God is with you. Amen. Now, I'm gonna put a natural illustration to help you understand how comforting that is. My kids growing up inside of my house, there was a lot of fears they never faced. 
My kids never came up to me. Oh, Father, oh, mighty Father that sitteth upon the porcelain throne. (laughs) Will we be able to pay the mortgage? Will we have enough money to have food on the table? Man, dude, they never worried about the electric bill. Our house was lit up. You could see it from the moon. They never worried about money. My kids had nothing to their name, but they were rich. Why? Because I was their dad. At least they thought I was rich from their perspective. And so like when we went into Chuck E. Cheese, they weren't worried about nothing because dad could provide all the tokens they needed because dad was with them. Now, if dad wasn't with them, that's a different story. But as long as dad was there, they were good. Now that my kids are grown, they're worried a lot about a lot more things because <laughs> dad ain't with them. Now they'll call me, hey dad, what about, well, let me pray with you about that. Can you send me a check? Well, let's talk about God, your provider. <laughs> so as a parent, your job is to put your, de- your kid's dependence on God to move it from you to God to teach them how to trust God. But they weren't afraid of many things because they knew dad was with them. Right. And your heavenly father is with you. Jesus said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Lo, I'll be with you unto the end of time. Even in death, Jesus promises to be with us. He says that when you cross through the waters, I will be there, meaning the waters of death. And when you cross through the waters of death, Jesus is there and he'll be the first face you see. Truly, we have nothing to fear as believers. Psalm 23, I love this Psalm so much. He, speaking of Jesus, the good shepherd, leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. What comforted David? That God was with him. And I love what he calls the valley of the shadow of death. It's a shadow. The thing that you fear, if you understand, it's simply a shadow. Shadows have no substance. When was the last time you read on the news, six people taken out by a shadow? (laughs) Shadows don't take out people because there's no substance. David says, the thing that I'm afraid of has no substance. You know where the substance is? It's in the shepherd that's with you in the valley of the shadow of death. Now, I'm encouraged that David said that I'll get to the other side. Jesus brought me in. Jesus will bring me to the other side. Now, the valley's a little bit longer than I always want, but either way, he's gonna get you through. I love this definition of fear. Fear is false evidence appearing real. False evidence appearing real. I love this study that uh, Michigan University did on fear. Uh, This is statistics they found regarding the things that we tend to fear. They found that 60% of our fears never come to pass. Think about that. 60% of your time that you lay awake at night, losing sleep, worried about certain things, never happen. Then we go, 20% of our fears are focused on your past. Well, you can't change your past, but the good news is the blood of Jesus can cleanse our past. 10% of our fears are petty, meaning they're really not any substance to them. Only four to five percent of our fears can be considered can be considered justifiable. So here's a great question today: What's the ninety five percent of things you're worried about today that genuinely don't matter? What if you took that energy and you put it into the things of God? Fear is like a rocking chair. There's a lot of movement, but you're going nowhere. And how many energies have we put into the things that we're afraid of? And we're just going back and forth, but we truly don't get anywhere inside of our life. I like what Mark Twain, the satirist said. He said this, I have suffered a great deal of many catastrophes in my life, most of which have never happened. (laughs) So true. You know, fear really is faith. It's just faith in reverse. It's faith in your problem rather than faith in your problem solver. And so you have enough faith. You just need to put it in the right thing. Put it in God rather than your problem. If God could save you from the biggest problem you ever had, which was a hell you could not get out of, if he took care of that problem, everything else is petty. Everything else is small and significant to the greatest problem he's already solved from you. David, or Paul said this in Psalm, Romans chapter eight. He said, how will he not along with him give us freely all things? If he took care of salvation, he's gonna take care of everything else that we need. The second thing he says to Joshua is you need to speak up. He says, this book of the law shall not 
depart out of your mouth. Now, the word, biblical word is meditation. So meditation in the Hebrew context is a picture of an animal that chews its cud. So animals like sheep and cows, they have multiple stomachs, so they eat their grass, they chew it, goes down into one stomach, comes back up, they chew it, goes back down to another stomach, and they just spend their entire day regurgitating the word of God. That's what we're to be doing with the word of God. So it's not like a Pop-Tart that you just grab in the morning and go, oh, Jesus, let me, no, 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 and that bam, and you're off with the rest of your day. You're to be in the word in such a way that you're meditating and chewing, reminiscing that word, that passage all day long. And then it's to be in your mouth. We're to speak the word of God. Satan can't read your mind, but he hears the words coming out of your mouth. When the enemy came to tempt Jesus in the wilderness at the beginning of his ministry, Jesus quoted the word. He quoted, he said, it is written. It is written, it is written. Satan isn't afraid of the Bible on your coffee table. Satan isn't even afraid of the word that's in your mind. Satan is afraid of God's word that comes out of your mouth. There's power when we speak the word of God. That's why Paul, when he's talking about the armor and put on the full armor of God, he likens the word of God to a sword. A sword is only effective when you pull it out and you swing it. We need to get proficient at speaking the word of God. So here's what we should do. We spend more time talking about our problem with everybody than we do talking to God about our problem. First, go up, speak up with God about what it is you face. And once you've spent time talking to God about it, now go talk to your problem about your God. That's good. Tweet that. Talk to God about your problem, then talk to your problem about your God. We see this perfectly illustrated in David, the giant problem solver. David spent uh, time in Bethlehem. Bethlehem means house of bread. Now, Goliath came out and the Philistines came out and they stood on the land of Judah. Judah means praise. Now, they came and stood on the land for 40 days. Israel was afraid of this giant. They came out and mocked them twice a day. And they talked about their problem. They talked about, did you see how big the giant is? Did you see what, you know, he was wearing today? Did, did, did you hear what he said today? They talked about it. They tweeted about it. They posted about it. They had prayer meetings about it. They talked about their problem. But David came from that Bethlehem, meaning the house of bread. Do you know where David was? He was in the word of God. He might've been writing Psalm 23 during that 40 day period. He was in the word. He was talking to the word. He was talking to God. And he came from Bethlehem with a different perspective because he was in the word. Then he speaks the word to the giant. He goes, hey, you come at me with a sword and a spear, but I come at you in the name of the Lord God of Israel. Today, I'm gonna chop off your head. And oh, by the way, I'm gonna come after the rest of you all. You gotta love a 17 year old with brain damage. The Bible says he picked up five smooth stones. Why? Because Goliath had four other brothers. David actually, through his lineage of of giant killers, took out Goliath's whole family, by the way. But he had five stones. I love the optimism of a 17-year-old. I got five rocks, but I'm gonna take out the rest of y'all. That's guts. How could he say that? How could he be courageous? Because he came from the house of bread, from the word of God, and then he spoke to his problem, not going around the camp having a prayer request about it. Half of what we call prayer meetings are really just meetings to complain about our problem and how big it is. I'm all about prayer. I'm all about prayer partners, but we should spend more time in prayer than talking about the problem we're praying for. That's good. All six of you, you're welcome. (laughs) There was a lion trainer who was in a circus performance and he had a cage full of man-eating lions and he was in there cracking his whip and he had a stool and he was, you know, talking to him. And, and all of a sudden the power went out unexpectedly in that circus and it just went pitch dark. Well, everybody in that crowd was just, oh, you know, they were horrified because here's this guy in a cage in the pitch dark with lions. And so about 30 seconds later, which probably felt like eternity, the lights came back on and they were expecting to see carnage. They were expecting to see this man devoured. When the lights came on, He was doing exactly what he had done when the lights were turned out. He was cracking the whip. He was calm. He was talking to him. Well, they rushed to the cage, opened it up, brought him out. 
And they pulled that man aside. They said, sir, what was going on through your mind <laughs> during that time? He goes, well, I know this. Lions have perfect night vision. They could see everything I was doing. But they didn't know I couldn't see them. So I faked them out. <laughs> there are times <laughs> you just fake out your problem. There are times I faith it out is what I do. I just keep speaking the word of God in spite of what I see. I keep speaking what God says. I keep standing going, greater is he that is in me, that if God be for me, it doesn't matter who or what is against me. And you just keep speaking. Yeah, but it's dark. But Jesus, the light of the world is in me. (laughs) And I will get through this valley and I'll make it to the other side. Joshua 1, 10. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people saying, pass through the camp and command the people saying, prepare provisions for yourself for within three days you will cross over this Jordan and go to possess the land which the Lord your God is giving to you to possess. The third thing is this, you gotta step out. At some point, you gotta step out and start facing your fear and you need to start moving in the direction of that thing that you might be afraid of. What has God spoken to you that maybe has paralyzed you, that stopped you, that like the Israel before Joshua's generation that he was leading didn't make it into the promised land because they were afraid of those giants. Fear paralyzed them. Maybe God's put in your heart a dream to to, to run a business, a, a dream to apply for that promotion inside of your company, to maybe learn a new skill, to to adventure something in some way. Maybe it's to get into ministry and step out and be used by God at a greater level. Maybe it's to tithe. But whatever it is, take a step in the direction of the thing that you're afraid. And that's what God told Joshua. You got three days, get ready, because we're moving. Now, the Bible says that Satan is like a roaring lion. Now, when lions hunt, they take the oldest lion, the male lion, who lost a lot of its teeth, and they use him for the roar because he's not really good at anything else. So he goes on one side of the prey, and then the lionesses, who do pretty much all the hunting and all the work, pretty much like today, uh, (laughs) they go on the other side. So what the lion does is he roars. Now, the animal either is paralyzed with fear, which is not good either because they just pounce on them and eat them, or they run in the opposite direction of the roar. And what they do is they run right into the trap. And that's how Satan operates. That's what the the Bible's telling us. He's like a roaring lion. Now, what I like that's in that verse, seeking whom he may devour. He can't just devour you. He can't just devour anybody. That's what we're gonna be addressing next week. We're gonna talk about the believer's authority and the victory that we have in Jesus Christ. And then the fourth week, we're gonna talk about the supernatural angels and demons and their specific roles. But the good news is you won't be afraid of what we're going to say because you're gonna come next week and hear about the authority that we have and that Satan is defeated. He's like a roaring lion. I like what one of my college professors used to describe Satan. He said this, he said, Satan is like a mouse with a megaphone. He squeaks and it comes out a roar. (laughs) Everything he said just seems to be amplified. So here's the thing, a wise gazelle doesn't run from the war. A wise gazelle would run straight to the roar because that's the safest place you could be. When the enemy's roaring at you, telling you you can't and you shouldn't obey God and you shouldn't take that step of faith, you run to the roar, not from the roar. Now, David, the psalmist, gives us another great insight on this very thing as we close. Psalms 23, four and five. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You know, if I could rewrite the Bible, which is good, I shouldn't, but I would rewrite a couple verses. (laughs) This is what I would say. You prepare a table before me because you wiped out all my enemies. (laughs) Like I I would just go, God, just deal with them all. Remove every problem that I'm ever gonna face. In spite of the presence of your enemies, God says, I'm gonna prepare a feast for you. In fact, what you'll often find is the greatest, most nourishing feasts that you have with God and the richest times you have in the word is because you have enemies. Because it's in the midst of your enemies that God says, I'm gonna prepare a banqueting table before you. I'm gonna teach you things and show you things you wouldn't have had time to listen to because everything was going great. I have found God has my attention when I have problems. But I'm very distracted when everything is going really well. God, why aren't things more perfect in my life? Because you wouldn't be in church. You wouldn't be in the Bible nearly as much as you are 
when you have problems. And God often speaks the loudest to us in the presence of our enemies. Here's another thing that you can look at this. In the presence of your enemies, there's a banqueting table. Now, anybody who has a garden, who has a large section of produce that they wanna protect, they know there's predators. So what do you put in that garden? You put up scarecrows to scare away the predators. Now, a smart bird would go, hey, scarecrows, buffet guys, let's go. (laughs) Problems are like scarecrows. Satan will put up problems. He'll put up a giant situation to keep you out of where God says, I have a feast for you. Behind your greatest problem is the greatest buffet of blessings that God has for you. Don't be afraid of the scarecrow, run to it. Unless you saw that really scary movie where the guy got into the scarecrow years ago, horror movie, how many know what I'm talking about? That was creepy, okay. (laughs) All right, I guess we end on that. Every head bowed, every head closed. (laughs) We thank you, Jesus, that you left heaven to come to earth, that you for so loved the world that you died, that everybody might have an opportunity to find Christ. Lord, we pray for anyone listening, anyone watching who doesn't know Jesus as their savior, that they would come to Christ today. Anyone who's maybe away, wandered, drifted, that today they would come back to Christ. If you don't know this Jesus, there in St. Charles, there online, I'd love to lead you in a prayer. The Bible says if we confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord, believe in our heart, that God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. We can do that right there where you are. You don't have to get your life together to come to Christ. You come as you are and Jesus will put your life together. We love you, we believe in you, we'd love to pray with you. Wherever you're at, join in with us as we say this prayer together out loud. Jesus, thank you that you died for my sins that you rose from the dead to save me. I confess you as my savior and as my Lord. I can't save myself. I trust that the finished work of the cross and of your resurrection to save me. Thank you that you love me and that from this day forward, you begin to change me to look like you in this earth. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Church, let's give them a big hand clap. So proud of you. Greatest decision that you could ever